Right, morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. I just have a, uh, a quick 10-minute slot, really, um, to hopefully give a bit of a, a bit of food for thought into to add to some of the discussions that have already been had and that will happen the rest of today. Um, it's just given a quick uh, explanation of Triodos Bank, which I'll come back to. Um, I'm head of personal banking in the UK. Uh, we operate in five countries uh, across Europe. Um, and I just, hopefully you'll come away from this uh, with just one extra to see that, you know, there are alternatives, there are ways of doing things. Now, I appreciate that many of you will know about Triodos, um, so I don't want to uh, patronise, but one of the challenges I think we've got is that there's so much negative... Uh, uh, negative coverage and, and soul searching really in terms of where we go from here and we're kind of sat down there in Bristol and in Edinburgh sort of waving saying you know we're doing something we're doing something and it's not just us but if one message I can get across it's that there are other things going on um, that hopefully can really grow. So Triodos itself um, set up in 1980 in the Netherlands uh, came to the UK in 1995 um, we've long had a presence in Edinburgh although we're headquartered in Bristol. Um, and some of you may know we've, we've just moved to a new office in Hanover Street. Um, so I'm sure if, if after my presentation um, people are interested, then you know, please do pop by um, any time you're passing. I thought I'd just start my short presentation with quite an obvious statement, really, um, which is that money has the power to change the world. Now, obviously, all of you know that. Um, the reason I put it up there is that Again, I think there's so much negative feedback, rightly, about finance, about banks, about money, and I, I certainly feel that it's seen in a very negative light now, understandably, given everything that's gone on. Um, but the thing that motivates me and the things that really inspires me is that you know, it's a man-made construct, and therefore, you know, if we can get ourselves into this mess, then surely we can get ourselves out of it. And that's because... Money can ultimately fuel positive things and it can fuel negative things. And I'll come on to say what we do, but purely in terms of lending, you know, banks and individuals have a choice about how they, how they use their money. Uh, money can be used for funding weapon production. It can be used for funding you know, intensive agriculture. Or, as I'll say in a minute, it can also be used to fund renewable energy. It can be used to support organic uh, farming and, and the list goes on. But we have a choice there. That's the key point. Now, this next slide, I think, is one of the ones that never fails to surprise me um, and depress me in equal measure. Um, one of the real challenges that we have at Triodos uh, is to increase awareness, really, not just of the brand, not just of the bank, but of the principle that there is, like I said, a different way of doing things. Um, and also about how banking works. And it strikes me, I, I don't know what you all think, but it strikes me that is a bit of a paradox in that there's been a huge amount of media coverage over the last few years since the, since the banking crisis. And yet, to me, it, it often operates at a level of, uh, you know, talking about bond deals, of quantitative easing, of NPC decisions, so on, so on. And I suppose from where I'm sat, you know, talking to individual savers, I get the sense, and this was backed up by some research we did, that there's a real gulf in terms of understanding for your average person on the street, the 21 million savers in the UK, you know, I just challenge us to say we need to have these academic and theoretical discussions. Of course we do. Um, but what does the average person on the street understand about how banking works? And just to illustrate this, you know, nearly a third of the public that we sampled genuinely thought that their cash, when they handed over at a bank to put into an ISA or to put into a savings account, they thought it stayed in a vault in a back room. You know? And they could, they could just go in and get it whenever they wanted. And then... Moreover, 60% of the, of the people that we spoke to um, were completely oblivious to the fact that their money might actually then be used for something, let alone that it might be used for stuff that they actually fundamentally disagree with. So I just maybe keep that in the back of our mind in terms of how we, how we get the, 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 the person on the street to, to buy into what we're talking about. And that really comes on to um, you know, the issue about where is money being used? And most people just don't know. And I don't think that's anyone's fault. I think a lot of it comes back to the fact that banks are pretty opaque. They don't, they're not transparent. So how would you know as a consumer? And how would you know, certainly until recently, that there is anything that you should even be worrying about? Um, 
I won't spend too much long on this next point, but it's just to, again, just plant that seed of, of thought, really, which is that someone earning 20K a year for their working life has somewhere in the region of a million pounds that flows through them at some point during their life. And it's just, a, there's a theme, hopefully, in this presentation that if you scale that up through the number of people in this country, the UK, Europe, and the world, then the real impact for change, if we start to get some cohesive movement amongst the public, I think is massive. So, consumer choice. I mean, one of the things, again, that we found interesting at Tridos is that there's been a real rise in ethical consumerism, as many of you will know, over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And, you know, you only have to look at uh, fair trade, free range, organics, all of them show a long term upward trend. And somehow ethical and sustainable banking seems to be lagging a little bit. And personally, I think it's because of the opaqueness and the fact that it's a bit scary and it's, it's not easy to understand. Um, but there is a bit of an irony here when we try to bridge this gap, which is that you can, you can look around for an organic chicken for your, for your Sunday roast. Um, and then you could go home, you could go onto your online bank and you could move some of your monthly salary into a savings account with a high street bank that may potentially be actually used to lend to intensive agriculture. And there's a real, you know, there's a real sort of um, paradox there. Um, and I think a lot of this does come back to awareness. So last couple of slides really to finish up, just to say what we do at Triodos Bank and to present the, the, the idea that there are um, banks out there, um, small banks that are doing something different. Three things, really, I would say that, that we do differently. The first one is about where we lend to. So we only lend to businesses and organisations that are actively working to improve society and environment. Uh, now, that covers a range of um, businesses and organisations, from renewable energy through to cultural institutions through to social housing, quite a long list. Um, but all ones that we feel are taking society and the planet in the right direction. And through doing that, we really aim to connect savers, general public, um, who value these things with businesses that are actually acting to, to bring about that change. Second one, I think is very pertinent at the moment, and, and it, it, I always raise a wry smile when you look at the advertising at some of the big banks, and they're clearly falling over themselves to try and create a, a, a better image. Um, but we genuinely believe that you know, there needs to be more responsibility in banking. So we don't gamble. We don't operate a bonus culture. Um, we're values-led. Um, our chief exec um, recently addressed a conference and he said that he genuinely thinks that we're the only bank, um, certainly in the UK, which can hand on heart say that human dignity is the reason why we're in business. And it's hard to say that without sounding sort of pious and holier than thou, but it is true. Um, and, and that is really about how we do business and, and where we lend to. And lastly, really summing up those first two is, is transparency. Again, everyone talks about trans transparency at the moment, um, but to actually make it real rather than just hot air, I think you need to you know, put your money where your mouth is. And um, one of the ways we do this is that we show our savers every place that we lend to. Um, we've got an online tool, which is here, so it's just a, just a slide showing. You can basically put your postcode in um, and you can see projects that we lend to within a radius of where you live. Um, and we post a document out to all of our savers once a year called Inspiring Change, which lists every place that we lend to. My last slide, um, you know, without impact, ultimately, this is hot air, I would argue. So I won't go through all of these numbers, but just to illustrate that there is this, this getting savers to move their money and to offer an alternative has genuine impact on the ground. Um, the one in the bottom left there, so the renewable energy projects we finance um, through Savers Money um, now powers over 1.2 million European households. Um, and just to show it's not just all about renewable energy, um, in 2010, the finance that we gave to cultural institutions enabled more than 3 million people to visit them um, that previously wouldn't have done because they may not have got funding elsewhere. And I'll just finish off with this one point. Um, all of you will know that we're in the middle of ISA season at the moment, so every bank you walk past is clamouring over themselves to, uh, to get your, your £5,640. Um, <laughs> and to move your balance at the same time. Um, and coming back to impact, and you know, I talked about why I get up in the morning to come into Triodos. You know, this, for me, at least, illustrates it. For £1,000, so that's 
less than a fifth of your 2012-2013 cash ISA allowance, if that £1,000 were lent out through the kind of stuff we do, then if it were lent into renewables, it would power, it would provide green electricity for one house for a year. If it was organic farming, we calculated it would uh, support the production of about 350 organic meals. And into the cultural sector, it would enable visits for about, I think it was 280 people into uh, cultural venues that otherwise may not have been able to continue. And that is £1,000. You know, you times that by the 21 million savers in the UK, the 20 odd billion pounds that we've we'll taken into ISIS this year. And that's what really motivates me in terms of thinking, well, if just a fraction more, if just a fraction more of the public and the savers and the way that banks do business were to shift to the kind of direction that we operate at Tridos, and I genuinely think that this can be part of the answer to the challenges that we face. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, would you like to take the podium? Mm -hmm. Not taking questions. Could I ask oh, one question, actually? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, because I, I don't think I'm going to be on the panel. Oh, so if course. there's any quick questions, then... Sorry. Uh, then yeah, any, any... Okay, Richard has a very brief question to start with. Thanks for the presentation. This is really, I think, great stuff. And uh, so thanks for coming. Thanks for supporting. And, and thanks for telling us more about Triodos. Just one question. Um, when you make your decisions to lend, uh -huh. um, OK, there's, there's, uh, there's the UK organization of Triodos. There's headquarters somewhere else, perhaps. Yep. Um, within the UK, say, Edinburgh. Uh -huh. um, as I say, we're talking about lending decision in, in Edinburgh. Who makes that decision? Will it be the loan officer on the ground in Edinburgh? Or will it be Bristol? Or will it be somewhere else? Thanks. So the, no, it's, it's a good question. And I think it, it comes back to one of the ways that we do business, which is, again, another one of the cliched words is relationships, I think, which is always banded around at the moment. Um, the way that we... Uh, Right. On the lending side is that we have a, as you would expect, a, 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 credit, a credit risk committee. Because it's just important to say that whilst we lend to businesses that we um, think are, are, are working to make the world a better place, we're not, you know, they, they have to be sustainable. They have to be economically viable. So there needs to be a, a credit decision um, so that ultimately our savers don't end up losing their money when the, when the bank goes under. So, um, in answer to your questions, therefore, the, the, the credit committee, which sits in Bristol but has involvement um, with, the, with the guys, some of whom, David, um, you may have met downstairs, um, that work in the Edinburgh office, and there's a UK decision about where we lend to um, on a number of factors, partly mission, partly economic viability, um, partly fit with the bank. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any, any more questions for Hugh? The lady uh, here. Yeah. here. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to stack them up. Oh, yeah. We're actually okay. running about 20 minutes late now, so I'm so sorry we haven't got time for all of your hands. Thank you. Deepa Govindarajan, University of Reading. Um, one of the points you made was demanding transparency from our banks, and if you deal with any of the high street banks, you'll know that uh, speaking to a call centre in India, let alone a branch here, you can hardly get an answer about your banking question, forget about demanding transparency. Can I suggest that in order to demand greater transparency, and this is a recommendation to policymakers and economists in the room, we should have greater transparency on corporate risk appetite, and we should demand accountability to a larger group of stakeholders than just shareholders. Currently, financial reporting is entirely aimed at shareholders, and they do not have the wider interests of stakeholders in mind. Thank you. Hello. Um, I appreciate very much the way that uh, Trilos is operating because it uh, allows to, to uh, uh, set the uh, standards for, for other banks, uh, which they are unable to meet at the moment, I think. But I have one little question, and it, I ask it mostly because uh, you will not be part of the debate. But like for instance, yesterday there was a lot of talk by uh, Mr. Werner, for example, that um, a big problem is uh, privatization of, of money creation. and. As you're a, a bank with special uh, uh, values, of, of course, but which is in this system, I, I'm very uh, uh, interested to know what what would you think of of this kind of uh, of, of um, what, what he proposed actually that, that this is what should be countered. How, how does Triodos think about changing the the the, the structural uh, shape of how the financial sector is is organized? 
Okay. Just one more up here, and then I'm sorry, that's all we've got. Thanks. Um, I, yes, Hugh, I was just wondering, what is the constraint on stopping Triodos getting much, much bigger, assuming that you'd be happy to do that? Yep. Is it because you can't get enough deposits? Is it because you haven't got enough projects to lend to? Mm -hmm. Or is it that you are constrained by the amount of capital you have? I was just sure. interested. Yep, okay. Okay, I'll, my, my interpretation of those three questions, and shout if I've got it wrong, but I think... Um, on the transparency issue, I suppose my take on transparency, I, I think, like I said, I think everyone's trying to do it. Uh, my personal view is that I think people are being pushed to become increasingly transparent. Um, I think arguably we're seeing more transparency on pay. I know there's been a lot of transparency on interest rates. Um, I suppose the way that I come at it from is that I would question, you know, are many banks going to become completely transparent of their own volition? I, I, I don't know. Um, and, and therefore, I would argue that the onus is on the public and the people that have savings accounts, the people that have bank accounts, the people that have individual shares, to really have a bit more of a voice. Um, and I think that can be hard, and it needs to go hand in hand with regulation. Of course it does. Um, but ultimately, and this is just the way I look at all of this, if you know, if, if X percent of savers with any big bank were to vote with their feet in any greater numbers than they currently do, then people would very quickly sit up and listen. And for me, that is, <laughs> that is the way where we're going to get real change. And so my role, and, and Triodos, and not just Triodos, but other banks such as Triodos, I think have a very important role, which is to stimulate and, and really be the alternative for public demand which then ultimately starts to have a louder voice and hopefully creates broader change. That's just my take on it. Um, the second question, um, sorry, I, I'm sure I don't understand as, as, as much as, as you guys have been discussing about some of the, the, the technical proposals. Um, I think in terms of our, our role in terms of changing the banking sector, I, th I think, again, without looking at too much just from, from where we're sat, I think we feel that we have a role as a, a thought leader <laughs> You know, we are a bank, we are within a financial sector that exists at the moment. So I think we can, we can, we can sit outside of that and we can, we can say how it's dysfunctional and we can say how it doesn't work and we can, we can say that it's, that, it's, that it's poor. Or we can say, look, we are a bank, we're in it, but we're fundamentally genuinely doing things different. And it comes back to my point there, which is that I think through doing that and through hopefully encouraging uh, people to come to us, then it becomes an increasingly viable model um, which in time, you know, however many years in the future, hopefully then uh, more mainstream banks who currently aren't operating like this can start to take it more seriously and think, well, actually, this is the way we need to go. Um, and then, the, yeah, the, the last question was about growth, wasn't it? Um, the short answer to that is that, um, partly linked to my ethical consumerism point, I think there are increasingly um, projects, great projects, around the UK and around Europe which, which need funding. And sadly, a lot of the big banks aren't providing sufficient funding for those projects. So um, I think across Europe and in the UK, we've seen, I mean, we've seen huge growth. Um, we saw, I think it was about 35% growth in lending last year in the UK. Um, across Triodos as a whole now, you know, within the space of just over 30 years, we've grown to over 300,000 customers. Um, and yeah, in the scheme of things, we're small. Um, but the rate of growth, I think, is attracting attention and it's sustainable growth as well. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if one in five savers in the UK move to Triodos and ethical banks, then, of, you know, of course that's going to be a, a constraint on, on what we can do because we're retail funded. We don't borrow from wholesale markets. So we can only lend out what we've got in. And, and our current levels of growth have meant that that can be pretty impressive. Um, I'd always want... I'd always want more because we're passionate about the projects that we lend to, and, and that does need um, savers ultimately to, um, to come to us in increasing numbers. <laughs>